Hello, everyone. This is Louis Malmadrona speaking to you on behalf of Barbara Mangi and Patrick McFarland, our colleagues. <clears throat> um, our affiliations are listed here. Um, Barbara and I are with Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. Patrick is with the Northern Light Health Family Medicine Residency, and we're all associated with the University of Maine. So uh, this is how to reach me. This is a picture of Barbara, and uh, we'll be interspersing some photographs of Maine, of which the one on the left is not. It's a castle in France, but uh, we love it. And uh, we have nothing to disclose, but please feel free to contact us and for further discussion. So uh, we're grateful to Albert Marshall, a Mi'kmaq elder um, from Eskasoni First Nation in, New, in uh, Nova Scotia for originating and developing the concept of two-eyed seeing. Um, we also want to acknowledge the, the original people of the land from where I speak, uh, the Wabanaki, which means the people of the dawn. And these compose five tribes, the Penobscot, the Maliseet, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, and the Abenaki. And finally, I'm grateful to CFHA for allowing us to present. So in Mi'kmaq, the word is Eptuaptamunk, and it means um, seeing with both eyes, seeing more than one perspective at the same time. So the idea was created as a way to integrate indigenous knowledge with other knowledge systems. And the concept, of course, applies equally well to any silenced population. Um, and in our case, it's indigenous Mainers, uh, but it could be immigrants, homeless people, voice hearers, whomever has another perspective that doesn't often or always get heard. So the goal, Albert's goal, uh, was to help us to, as a culture, to help us as a people, not just indigenous people, to help us appreciate the wisdom of the indigenous world and to acknowledge that there are other epistemologies to complement the contemporary scientific approach. And if one looks at the progress of modernity, in terms of climate change, pollution, uh, destruction of species, it may be that we need a more holistic wisdom, a more systems-based thinking, um, which is the essence of indigenous philosophy for human survival. Another Mi'kmaq word is Eptuaptamunk. Well, we talked about Eptuaptamunk. And what I meant was Natukalimk. So, and this is a photo of Albert. He's a little older than that now. Um, but the idea is that two leggeds are interdependent and interconnected with the natural and the spiritual world. So the key concepts are coexistence, interrelatedness, interconnectedness, and community. So, um, we're always trying to find another way to see things and a better way to do things. This is where two-eyed seeing originated at Cape Breton University in Sydney, Nova Scotia. This is their website. So um, the idea is that indigenous knowledge comes from consensus-driven systematic observations of how things work and it results in explanations that are useful um, and appealing. And that two -eyed, within two-eyed seeing, we acknowledge that these explanations need not make sense to the dominant biomedical paradigm to be effective and practical. So um, just a moment on indigenous philosophy. It's the opposite of positivism. Positivism 
claims that there is one cause and it will be found using the scientific method. It also claims that explanations exclude each other so that a full explanation of an event precludes any other full explanation of that event. And indigenous philosophy states that there can be many causes and many ways of finding those causes. And in fact, there might not be a cause, that, that there may be spontaneous emergence, which is a property of systems, that things can come into being without an apparent chain of cause and effect, and that multiple explanations exist, and that we should choose the explanation that works best for our context. So uh, indigenous philosophy is the opposite of reductionism. Reductionism claims that all gross phenomena can be described and predicted by fundamental microstructural theories. So indigenous philosophy is anti-reductionism. This is not to dismiss reductionist research, but to acknowledge that it's not the only explanation. For example, no matter how much I know about the neurocircuitry involved in depression and the related neurochemicals, uh, that knowledge will not explain why being in relationship and talking together within that relationship will make me feel better. Similarly, knowing how meditation works in the brain doesn't explain its beneficial effects on me. So uh, another way of, of talking about two-eyed seeing is to talk about explanatory pluralism. So, um, so we can allow more than one explanation and explanations are useful if they work. So how does this relate to substance use treatment? in Maine. So we acknowledge that whatever human beings are experiencing, there, there is a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspect to that experience. So that um, substance use needs to be approached from the standpoint of the physical, the emotional, the relational, the spiritual, and the community. And typically the, this notion of balance among these aspects of our lives is represented by a circle. And this is an example of one such circle as was this circle. Um, and uh, Various symbols are used to remind us of the aspects of maintaining balance, including animals uh, who are placed in the various directions. And um, the, the attributes of the various directions, which change by tribe, but balance being the primary focus. So um, addiction is a story and it's a story about how to cope with suffering, how to cope with intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, um, misery, pain, poverty, uh, lack of a future, lack of belonging. And one of our favorite authors is Leslie Marmo Selko who says, I will tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment. Don't be fooled. They are all we have, you see, all we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. So our program is decidedly narrative. And uh, I probably don't need to, to convince everyone that um, indigenous people in North America have 
numerous health disparities, including substance use, poor mental and physical health, um, and the like. And these are often rooted in the effects of European contact, including forced relocation, cultural genocide, and intergenerational trauma of many, many sources. Um, and and um, Braveheart and De Bruin have written really nicely about that. Uh, one of their favorite examples, which I think everyone should know about, was the Relocation Act of 1956, which moved um, individual indigenous North Americans and their families to job training centers in designated major U.S. cities. And uh, what it actually did, in fact, was to create a greater economic instability. Um, the people who went to these urban areas became unemployed, homeless, and disconnected from their community-based support networks. And this um, generated tremendous substance use disorders. So we need programming that incorporates traditional culture, cultural practices, promotes community involvement, and, and includes stories of healthy indigenous identity, and um, <clears throat> needs stories about how to live well. And research, had, a number of studies have shown that including traditional healing practices um, improves outcomes with substance use disorders. And um, it really, it's desperately needed here in Maine and in other parts of the country. So in 2018, ANIDA held uh, a meeting of key stakeholders to get feedback on um, the acceptability and uptake of medication-assisted treatment for opiate use disorders among indigenous North Americans. And the five themes that emerged from this meeting are worthy of discussing, that there is a, a mismatch between Western secular and reductionistic medicine and the holistic healing traditions of indigenous North Americans. And there is a need to integrate traditional healing practices into medication assisted treatment. That um, there is potential conflict uh, between uh, traditional philosophy for healing to include being medication free and engagement with medication assisted treatment that needs to be negotiated. There are systemic barriers as always. And uh, of course, we always need more research. So, um, so implementation strategies were developed and that um, led to a study in which representatives of 192 substance abuse treatment programs in indigenous North American communities uh, completed a survey about their use of medication-assisted treatment, and only 28% of the programs had implemented it. And um, philo philosophical conflict was the major reason for non-implementation. So, um, and um, so getting back to to Maine. Our communities are quite rural and remote, except for the Penobscot Nation, which is close to Bangor. Substance abuse is a problem for them as it is for all of the populations of rural Maine. And until uh, recently, a medication assisted treatment was only available in Maine cities, which was often a two to four hour drive from Maine's reservations. So um, we were able to obtain a grant and to create 
a program called Makwi, which comes from a Penobscot word meaning togetherness. And we worked with Maine's tribes and tribe, tribal related agencies to implement medication assisted treatment around the state. We provided consultation regarding philosophical barriers to implementing MAT. We provided physician consultants to several tribal MAT programs. We provided training in, in <clears throat> SBIRT, um, and which is brief intervention and referral, uh, motivational interviewing, and indigenous approaches to counseling, including narrative approaches. Uh, we provided education regarding co-occurring disorders, uh, including concomitant use of other substances, especially problematic in our region being methamphetamine. So um, we engaged in community meetings, talking circles, uh, dispensing of naloxone, discussions of stigma, um, and the like. So um, we provided narrative medicine and suicide prevention training. And um, what, what was the result of that? Um, at the beginning of um, MAQUI, there was only one medication-assisted treatment program in the, among the five tribes of Maine and at the urban center in Bangor. As of, as of um, today, three years after um, Makwi's implementation, and um, there are uh, every uh, site has an MAT program, except for the most Northern site, which has access to off-reservation MAT programs within a short driving distance. Um, that would be the um, Arostuk Band of Mi'kmaqs, who are in Presqu'ile, Maine, and uh, can drive within 15 minutes to an MAT program. So um, we share across the community's supervision, uh, thanks to telehealth, provide um, behavioral treatment um, to remote sites and um, share prescribers at times when um, problems arise from only having one prescriber. <clears throat> so we've gone from one MAT program to six. And um, we think that's quite a success. And what's next? So on October 19th, 2021, um, which is in the future as I speak to you, but will be two days in the past when you listen to me, um, our organization, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness, is cutting the ribbon on, <clears throat> on our new treatment center for Maine's indigenous people. This is in a community um, called Millinocket, Maine, which is well known for being the entrance to Mount Katahdin, the highest mountain in Maine and Baxter State Park. So, um, <clears throat> So our, our goal now is to become even more proficient at the integration of culture and indigenous knowledge with, with existing best practices in addiction treatment. And um, we'll be uh, enrolling our first clients in November of 2021, and we'll be actively engaged in research from the, from the onset about what works for indigenous people in indigenous country. So um, we're excited to be 
moving forward in this way. And uh, we think that two-eyed seeing will guide us to understand that um, indigenous communities need stories. And we need stories that help us to appreciate the consequences of substance use and also the resilience that communities have to um, work toward um, health and wellness. And so uh, I'm going to stop shortly so that we'll have time for some um, discussion. Um, and again, this is how to reach me and I'll be happy to put anyone in contact with Barbara and Patrick as well. So uh, I wanna thank you for listening and, and we'll move to live discussion or we'll already be live as the case may be. So um, that's all.